Welcome to Successful Living with Bill Napik. Every week, we talk with interesting people in a variety of professions for ideas to enhance your success in all aspects of life. Successful Living with Bill Napik starts right now. Here's Bill Napik. Welcome to the show. It is Successful Living with Bill Napik, and today, Successful Living with Dr. Brian Harkins, and this is a show first in so many ways. Number one, we're doing the show from the operating room in the Tom Ball Hospital. First of all, he is a surgeon and an incredible individual. We're going to learn about Dr. Harkins on this show today. Doctor, welcome to the show. Thank you. Good to be here. Well, here we are. First of all, we're in the operating room, so that's pretty cool. And one of the specialties we'll get into that you have developed along the way is robotic surgery. And we are behind, in front of the robotic surgery system called the Da Vinci machine. So first of all, let's tell people about your practice and what you're doing in, the, in helping people here in the Tomball area and really around the United States. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I uh, started back in 97 when I got here in Tomball. And uh, prior to that, I'd uh, been in the military for quite some time, and I did training on uh, the initial laparoscopic system, uh, and that's kind of how I built my practice. Uh, laparoscopy, of course, is, uh, is the, was the first minimally invasive platform that was popularized. Um, I learned it very early on and really fell in love with it because it made such a difference for patients compared to open technique. And so um, I started doing that, and when I uh, got out of the military, I was looking for a place to call home, and I found Tomball, Texas. Well, let's hit the military for a while, because when I first met you maybe two months ago or so, that was one of the impressive things I saw on the Internet, 16 years of service in the military. Let's tell people about that and thank you for your service and anyone that's a veteran or serving right now. We thank you for your service, but thank you, sir, for that. Thank you. 16 years, huh? 16 years. I enlisted uh, right out of high school. I knew I needed to have a, a means to um, afford a family and college, and uh, my wife and I had dated since the eighth grade, and we ended up getting uh, engaged in the junior year of high school and uh, married right after the senior year, and I went into the uh, military, like I said, Air Force, and I was a, a bomb builder at the time on the nuclear missile system, and that was how I got nighttime college out of the way. Well, let's, that's the other thing that was on your resume or your description, your bio, is I think it's a nuclear missile technician. Correct. So not everybody does that, or do we get the opportunity to talk and hear about <laughs> someone? Kind of dangerous work, and certainly, if not, probably super intricate like what you're doing today. Tell us about that. That's it's, interesting. I wouldn't say it's uh, dangerous any more than many other industrial-type jobs, but it's the 90-foot-tall uh, missiles that sit in the ground up in the middle of the country, the Miniman 3 system. And I was a technician working on the systems that maintained it and kept it going all the time, uh, changing out warheads, changing out the propulsion systems, and maintaining all of the other uh, equipment that goes around it because those silos have a full... Uh, HVAC, electrical, uh, they have everything around them, and we worked on all of those components as well. That's interesting, too. So th right there, the, the weapon, the missile itself, is temperature controlled, it sounds like. Absolutely. It's up in North Dakota, so it gets pretty cold up there, and it has to stay within a tight range of humidity and temperature. Fascinating, and it has to stay ready. Ready, all the time. Interesting. There's a whole subject and category of so many things that we hope are never used yes. in life and, and from the smallest things to the most massive things like a nuclear missile and what it can do. However, the, the idea of having things be ready and we hope we never need them, that's a whole category in itself and nuclear missiles, <laughs> they're right in there, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's an ominous sight. Uh, it's, in, a, in a way, it's a, a nice sense to know that it's there kind of keeping things in check. Uh, at least that's, that's the intent. That's what we hope for. But again, we hope we never, ever, ever have to see that in, uh, put into use. But they're there. But they're there. What was the first thing, going back to that experience on the nuclear missile, as a young man, you have to, have to look at, at, at this system and the missile, and from an, a technology standpoint, it must be mind-bending and just fascinating yes I didn't know any better to be honest with you at the time um, it was just it was all fascinating to me uh, you learned I learned a lot of different things coming out of high school that I had never been exposed to before and then was getting ready to start college almost sh shifted gears at one point uh, medicine had always been my direction even through my high school years it's just something I had a, a, a drive to to go to but then once I got exposed to this all this other um, engineering type science uh, stuff I, th I almost shifted gears into that but uh, stayed true to medicine in the long run 
and you're helping people in a tremendous way. I found you, you helped me, and I was so excited, not just with your skill and what I heard about you, but also when it comes to medical professionals, whether it's your general doctor, an ear doctor, whatever it is, every doctor has to have a certain manner, as we all have different personalities, but in the end, as a patient doctor, it's a very special relationship, and many times it, it's just a real quick thing, but it's very important, and I, I think not all medical professionals recognize that, and or there's such a pace right now and hurry up and numbers and that. I don't know that it's common to find someone that is doing such a good job like you in terms of having the manner, making people feel comfortable, knowing what they can expect, and that sort of thing. How does that happen, or is that just your personality? Well, I'd like to think it's, uh, it's a little bit of who I am, but it's also something that I have made as a focus. I see myself as an educator, uh, and I know all these things that I do are commonplace to me, but I recognize that patients don't come at it from that angle. So my goal when I have an encounter with a patient is to first educate them on their, their disease process, whatever that may be, uh, and at the same time, give them a little bit of comfort in, in knowing that this is something we do all the time. And yes, we all understand complications can happen from anything. And uh, I don't overemphasize that. It's, it's well uh, documented in the paperwork, and I bring it up in my discussions. But I try and uh, put the emphasis where it should be, which is on what the uh, most likely course will be for the procedure that we're going to do. In anything, the other thing, whether it's the medical world or real estate world or anything else, when we talk to someone, not all of us, but a lot of us that are maybe intuitive or certain have a certain sensitivity, we can detect and feel someone's confidence as well. When I met you, that's one of the things that encouraged me. I said, this guy knows what he's doing. So we're talking with Dr. Brian Harkins right here in the operating room in Tomball, Texas, at the Tomball Hospital. Let's tell people as far as what you do in the doctor world, and you're, you're a general surgeon, so some of the surgeries you perform and other things that you're helping people with. Well, as I mentioned, I, I left uh, the military and went uh, and became a, uh, a lapros I was already a laparoscopic surgeon. I was looking for a place to call home. Uh, at the t time, I came here to Tomball because they had a need for a minimally invasive surgeon. For years, I practiced in that uh, on that platform, which was uh, uh, something that helped patients in many cases, but it had limitations. And it was those limitations that we learned to work around and just to accept. And it wasn't until almost 2014 that I was introduced to the robotic platform by way of a CEO who came along and really helped me understand what the potential was on that platform. And that's unusual. Most of the time it's uh, physician to physician. But I had a visionary CEO at the time, Mr. Tom Jackson, who was here at Tom Ball. And, and uh, he opened my eyes to this. And so I got further into it and started looking at it. And I really began to understand that the robot was uh, an advancement of open style surgery as much as it was of minimally invasive, meaning the things that laparoscopic had been limited on, the robot had overcome, and I could do more minimally invasive surgery with more precision than I had been doing previously. Before we get to the next step, we've, you've mentioned the term minimally invasive several times. What's the advantage of that? I mean, I could guess, but as far as that goes, there, it sounds like in the history of surgery, they just cut you open, <laughs> to, say, to say the least. They cut you open, did the best they could. Through the history of medicine and surgery, things developed, and they came upon minimally invasive. And what was the advantage of that? Well, so obviously the, the biggest advantage, of course, is a smaller incision. Now, what happens with a smaller incision is there's less pain, uh, less potential for bleeding in, in, on the abdominal wall, less potential for infection on the abdominal wall. And in general, the biggest thing for patients is they get over the surgery quicker. They don't have to recover from a big gash on the abdominal wall. They can have the organ fixed or, or removed or whatever on the inside without having to have a large incision to do that. That's a big difference because depending, and I'm just guessing now, that where the incision is made, whether it's a robotic incision or with the manual incision, that could make a huge difference in recovery depending, because I think unless, until something's sore on our body, or in this case, cut with an incision, we don't realize how important that particular muscle is. Let's say it's on our abdomen, like you said, right. all of a sudden, every move you make, 
as you're driving every bump you're like oh man i could feel that same thing with the back i guess is that absolutely. right absolutely every breath you take uh uses the uh, the core muscles and every move you make uses the core muscles and if you have a big cut that can be very difficult to get over and especially if those incisions are are more horizontal because they cut the muscle instead of separating the muscle so the the, the beauty of the uh, minimally invasive platforms like laparoscopy was and now robotic is um, is that these incisions are very small. You basically make an eight millimeter, five to eight millimeter incision is the, gen the average uh, size, and you put a trocar through it, which is nothing more than a hollow tube to allow the instruments to pass through, and then insufflate or blow gas into the abdominal cavity so you can see, and then you work inside that space. And that's been the, the, the big uh, benefit for patients is you don't have to cut them wide open to get into the abdominal cavity to accomplish the task. So let's take someone through the procedure. Now, there have been people that are listening to the show right now that have had surgeries. Maybe 10 years ago, maybe their surgery was one done where it was not with a robotic machine like the Da Vinci machine that we're sitting in front of, but it was done manually. And let's say this person is about to have surgery again, these many years later, 2022, or there's someone listening that all of a sudden finds out they have to have surgery. They never had surgery before. Let's walk them through what they can expect. And you could pick an example of whatever surgery procedure we want to talk about. But let's take something that you do a lot here in the Tomball Hospital that what can they expect right now in 2022? Let's walk them in from the point of they're wheeling you into the operating room. Well, that's, that's uh, kind that's, of dramatic. That's too. well into the process, first of all. So, so here, at, here at HCA Houston Healthcare Tomball, we have actually three robotic systems, three Da Vinci XIs, uh, that, uh, one that we've required uh, just in the last year. And the, the, they're all in our older portion uh, operating room. So as you can see, the room we're in is fairly small. Uh, but it has enough room to do the procedure. That's the, that's the key thing. So when the patient rolls in, they're going to see this, this kind of um, bland, if you will. They're mostly uh, bland colors, and they're going to see the actual robot. Uh, they would see certain personnel walking around in, in uh, surgical gear because they have scrubbed in, and they're technically aseptic or sterile at that point. And then uh, they get moved over to the bed, and anesthesia starts talking with them, and they gently drift off to sleep is the ideal. Now, after that, they don't know a thing that's going on. <laughs> We're all working, doing our job, and then they wake up a, a, a little bit later, and they're not in the operating room anymore. By the time they gain consciousness, they're over in the recovery room. Give us an idea how many people are in the operating room at any given time. I guess it depends on the procedure, but... It does to some extent, but there's a core that's there. You're going to have someone at the head of the table for, for anesthesia that's going to maintain the airway and monitor the patient's physical status. Uh, there's going to be a surgeon, and there may be an assistant to the surgeon. There's going to be a scrub tech, who's the person who's responsible for the instrumentation, handing it back and forth, and uh, having those kinds of things ready. And they sometimes will help out and assist in the room uh, uh, as well. And then there's a scrub nurse, who's the non-sterile person floating around in the room. They run and get things. They help position the patient. They're responsible from the nursing side of the house for the room. And uh, they have multiple roles as well. So that's kind of a core, if you will. Sometimes you'll have an additional an assistant, or you may have an additional uh, scrub tech depending on how many uh, arms are being used that, and how many, how many extra hands you need in the procedure. So for the, from the patient's standpoint, and I've been at the other end of anesthesia, and I, that in itself, I want to touch upon that a little bit later, but that in itself is fascinating. And quite frankly, yeah. that's one of the things I liked about it because you have no problem falling asleep because you're talking to the anesthesiologist, anesthesiologist that is, and the next thing you know, you might have a joke with them or say a word or two. The next thing you know, it's like you're, good gone. Night, you're gone. And the fact that they can work on the human body, cut it open, move things around, sew things up, that just blows my mind. But we'll get to that in a second. So in the meantime, from the patient standpoint, they come in and you're working on them. As far as let's talk about, and the surgeon, correct me if I'm wrong, you're the team leader. You're like the musical director of all these people that you've mentioned. Is that true? Yeah, it, it, that's the uh, classic view of the surgeon is the captain of the ship kind of model. Uh, more recent models put people in a little more um, 
uh, open even uh, status, if you will. There's a, and the whole point was that was they want people to, to be able to speak up whenever they feel something needs to be said. Uh, in terms of the conduct of the operation, managing the operation, I'm clearly the uh, captain of that ship. I, I determine what we do, when we do it in terms of the operation component. And then also, I'm guessing like anything in life, as you go in, you prepare way before the surgery, the surgical procedure, but even before you have the best knowledge of all the things that the person's in there for, but every now and then I guess there's a surprise or something is unexpected or you didn't see it on the chart or whatever, and then you have to adjust accordingly and the team adjusts as well, I'm guessing. That's, that's, uh, that's certainly true. You never know. Sometimes you go in without knowing exactly what's happening. You simply know that there's a problem uh, that needs to be operated on, that, that, uh, like an acute abdomen, uh, and you are exploring. Those are called exploratory laparotomies if you cut them wide open or a diagnostic laparoscopy if you make the little holes. Now, of course, we have training and experience over years of, of schooling and then experience over years of practice that teach you what the uh, potential po uh, possibilities are and when something happens, what the appropriate response is. And that's what's important, that you, that you uh, just keep a level head uh, uh, in the operating room and you respond to in a safe manner in the patient's best interest. And speaking of the anesthesia component of the procedure, as the surgeon, are you, what sort of communication do you have, if any, or does that anesthesiologist just, they're on their own, but are you communicating with them? In the case, maybe I'm thinking offhand here, where you're doing something and it's going to take a little bit more time. Do you tell the anesthesiologist, hey, we're going to go another 20 minutes, or is that how does that work? Or does no, you're, that person you're, know? You're dead on. That, no, they, they, uh, they, they are uh, experienced as well, so they can recognize, they can watch the operation. Uh, sometimes in an open case they can see, and, on the, and when we do minimally invasive, it's always up on monitors. So we have these monitors around the room that they can look at. So they can kind of tell where we are in the procedure if they've seen it enough times. But, yes, there's a communication that's ha happening all the time. If something's not going well with the patient, they let me know in case I need to make adjustments. And if things look like I need more time or some other, or if they're, wait, if they're having a little bit of a, a regain of muscle function, uh, even, even when they're asleep uh, and paralyzed, sometimes the par paralysis wears off and they'll start tightening their muscles. During the procedure. During the procedure. And that's normal. You, they keep them at that certain point. And so as that's happening, if I'm insufflated or have gas in the abdomen, it can start to squeeze down on my space. And and I can talk with them and say, hey, I'm, uh, they're getting a little tight. And, and then they will adjust. They will uh, give them an additional paralysis um, and uh, make it easier for me to continue the operation. So there's a lot of communication that uh, the whole team uh, communicates all the time. You're probably already figuring it out. I always, if I could do it again, I might want to be an anesthesiologist. I think it's just <laughs> fascinating. The science, even the history, I don't know where it began, but how about that? I mean, what they can do is incredible. But going to that point where the person, before we even get to the robotic part and the actual surgery being done, the patient when they're under anesthesia, are they absolutely still? You're saying where they cramp up sometimes, but for the general, generally speaking, are they? Are, are we just laying there? Yes, and that's so it. That's it. They're <laughs> laying there. So when they're, the the induction, so the part that we skipped over was we said the patient falls off to sleep, and right. then, and so the what happens immediately after that is the anesthesiologist uh, will then uh, put in a breathing tube, generally. Uh, and that tube goes down into the airway and they take over breathing for the patient. That's what the ventilator at the head of the bed is for. And so that goes down while they're asleep and then, um, then we position the patient, do all sorts of other things. So it's the anesthesiologist who is definitely monitoring all of that piece of it and that's their, their role is to keep the airway moving uh, and, to, and when I'm operating, I need paralysis. So that's the piece that comes in. That's, that's partly for anesthesia so they don't buck when they're putting them to sleep. Uh, then it becomes for me in surgery so I can have the most space in the abdominal cavity. I bet a lot of people, including me, did not know that you have the airway and the breathing to consider. You just go to sleep and you're asleep. Okay, so from the time, whatever procedure we want to reference, someone comes in, the anesthesia, 
and let's say this is the robotic surgery, like we're in, and I encourage people go to my YouTube channel, simply go to radiobill.net. That's the gateway to the channel. So if you're hearing this as you're driving around Houston during the broadcast, go to the YouTube channel. You could see we're in an operating room. That does not happen every day. You could see the Da Vinci machine. We're gonna talk about that. It's a, an incredible device that, that is right behind us here. So go to the, to, to the video there. But from the time the person gets in, to where you put the trocars in, which are the, the, the p channels into the body, so to speak, very small, like straws, is that right? A little bigger than a straw, okay. but close to that. So that's your way to get into the body. From that point to where the machine is cranked up and the arms start moving, and at some point you leave the bedside, is this right, and walk over, and again, if you're looking at the video, you walk over to, I'll call it a control center. The but surgeon's it, console. The surgeon's console. So you walk over to that, and then you control the machine, and that procedure begins for whatever length of time. Correct. So we put the trocars in, and I do that with a, a small incision, and then they're pointed, and we watch them go in, and then we look inside and watch the rest of them come in. It takes anywhere from three or four, sometimes five, generally, depending on the procedure. And then once the trocars are in, we drive the robot patient cart, which has the robotic arms on it, up to the bedside and dock the trocars onto the robotic arm. Then we introduce the instruments which lock into the arms and the, these are special instruments and there's a big uh, component to them that differentiates them greatly from laparoscopy and that's that they have a wristed component to them. So they're, they're, the tips of them have not just open close but actually a wristed component that, fought, that moves just like my wrist moves when I make movements. The trocars, what, are, what material are they made out of? Uh, the trocars themselves are either uh, metal in the case of the robot or they're plastic sometimes in laparoscopy. The instruments uh, are very high-tech instruments. They, they, uh, it's, a, it's kind of a funny-looking long device, but like I say, on the tip is the actual component that basically allows to me like to have my hand inside the body, even though I'm not. And it has m uh, many degrees of motion that it can move. So I can roll my wrist, open my hands, turn side to side, and that is mimicked exactly on the inside by the instrument. And about how many minutes from the time someone is wheeled in through the doors of this room to where you have the machine in operation? Uh, interesting. Give or so take. We, we break that down here uh, at this hospital into multiple segments we watch along the way. And that's the whole thing. We want to be efficient in the operating room. We want to be safe, number one, but we also don't want to take all day to do a case. It's not good to have a patient under anesthesia for longer periods of time than necessary. So from the time you roll in, it's probably about 10 to 12 minutes before the anesthesiologist has you completely asleep. I would say it's another 10 minutes or so that there's a prepping and draping. Prepping means cleaning the abdominal wall off or whatever organ or area is going to be worked on. And then draping is taking sterile drapes and covering everything else except leaving exposed just the area we need to access on the body. And then once we start the, doc, the uh, uh, cutting process where I'm putting in trocars, my cut to console time averages somewhere around four minutes or so. And that's from putting in the trocars, docking up with the robot, then I sit down, and then the console time depends on the procedure. It may be as short as 20 minutes uh, for a gallbladder, or it may be an hour and a half for a colon. So that varies, and then we get up and then do the deconstruction piece of that, if you, if you will, where we pull the robot off, take the trocars out, sew up the holes, and then wake the patient up. You mentioned the colon. Let's talk a little bit about that. I would think there's several procedures that you're doing with the colon or any other organ or part of the body. However, I'm guessing one of them is where you cut the colon. That, <laughs> that is crazy. So we have a, let's describe the colon, first of all. It's a fascinating thing in itself, but it's like a, it's a, a tube that, like a garden hose maybe that's all squashed around in, in these different shapes in your butt. Would that be a way to say? Sure, sure. That's a, a, a good visual analogy for that. It's, what it is, is it's a long muscular tube. Uh, tube, that, that's that's, uh, we go from the mouth all the way to the anus with different segments of the GI tract. And the last portion is that colon and rectum. And uh, the colon is the larger piece. It's where most of the water is reabsorbed out of the food contents that we take down. And it's also where there's a um, uh, solidification from, of, the, of the stool contents. So it starts out liquid on the right-hand side, goes up and over and down on the left-hand side. And by the time it gets to the left side, it should be more solid. 
Um, it is a, it's, it's full of stool, so it's, it's separated from the interior of the body cavity by the wall of the colon, and that's an important thing. If it pops open, then you have stool in your abdomen, and that's not a good thing. That leads to peritonitis. So the fact that we cut it open and make connections to it has to be done under pretty regimented circumstances so that we can control that stool content. But when you cut, you actually will cut the colon, and then when the procedure's over, you reattach it. That's correct. That in itself, reattaching a tube that has a diameter, how does that, you're doing this with the Da Vinci machine in this case? I do, yes. That has to be quite complex, to say the least. It's, uh, you know, uh, I do a little backyard uh, plumbing work at, at the house, so it's, uh, it's principles are similar. Uh, there's, uh, there's techniques. You don't and, want any leakage. <laughs> no, you don't want, yeah, there's no and leakage that's allowed. Uh, that's definitely true. Um, so it's just basically sewing. A lot of it is sewing. There are stapling devices that we use routinely as well that have been around since the 1950s, and those are, are uh, commonly used in surgery where they have these little minute staples in multiple rows that will fire things, uh, fire staples across and cut at the same time reconnecting. So you've got a lot of different uh, options to, to put the bowel back together. Uh, the key thing, of course, is to have healthy uh, well vascularized ends that you're putting together and to put it together in a uh, with good integrity so that there is no leak well as we're talking about the colon right quick uh, you, we're all human beings here you're a doctor you get to see things and you're doing things helping people in a tremendous way and in a, in a unique way as well but one of the things we all want to do is prevent things I mean nobody wants that procedure right. unless they need it Nobody wants a whole lot of different surgeries unless you have to have it, and then you really want it by a tremendous doctor, no doubt. But how do we, let, let's just take issues, and we can't cover them all, just some of the basic things that you come up with. But the colon is so important from so many standpoints. But what are some of the things we could do just to have a healthy body, but a healthy colon in this case? How do we prevent problems? So the most common problem that you would be preventing would be diverticular disease. That's probably the most common colon issue, diverticulitis, diverticulosis. Um, and the best way to prevent that is with fiber. You need fiber in our diets, which in the Western world, we have a hard time getting a lot of fiber. Uh, things are so processed out that the fiber content is decreased and you have to almost overeat to get the fiber quantity. So I'm real big on supplementation. I, I uh, tell all my patients that they should use fiber supplementation. It's too easy. Like a Metamucil. That's one. There are three different kinds of fiber and not everybody agrees with each one. So I encourage patients to try different ones to find the one that works best for them. And they all come in different forms from powder to pills to, to gummy bears. And so any of those works and I encourage them to work it out so that it's part of their regular day uh, so that they can have fiber supplementation because that will uh, decrease the risk of diverticular disease over time. Well, I have to ask, what, which one do you take? <laughs> I, I, I like the gummy bears. I'm a candy <laughs> The lover. gummy bears? Absolutely. Yeah, they've got little gummies that have fiber in them, and that I keep them on my vanity, and that's my little treat as I'm getting ready in the morning as I take my little gummies. Well, somewhere along the way in the supplementation world, someone grabbed onto the gummy <laughs> concept because I'm like you, except not from a fiber standpoint. I have a uh, magnesium supplement I take at go. night that helps drift me off to sleep. But it's, it's one of my treats because it's a gummy bear. And then there's another one I take for uh, elderberry tea or the elderberry syrup gummy bear as well. So go gummy bears. <laughs> and, and that is a tremendous medical advancement. Someone was made some money on that too, no doubt, no right? No doubt, no doubt. <laughs> so so that, the, the, that's one thing for the colon. Generally speaking, as a doctor, knowing what you do, and not necessarily in surgery, but just as a healthy individual, what are some of the things you're doing to make sure just you're healthy in general. I'm, you, you're well, in great shape. Apparently you're working out and you're, are you eating right or, or what should we do? Uh, well, let's don't get into my eating habits. That's All not right. a pretty okay. sight. So I'm, I'm, I'm human. Uh, no, I, I, I certainly, uh, moderation, right? Uh, moderation is key. Moderation is key. And it's always, uh, the, the, one of the big things I'd like to bring up with that is the surveillance side. Don't ignore this, uh, the recommendations for colonoscopy. Colonoscopy is very important. Uh, it can find, it can prevent a cancer by finding it before it turns into a cancer and it can find cancers that are early and not let them show up late. 
So it's recommended at, cert, at a certain age, and there's different recommendations, but somewhere in the 40 to 50-year-old uh, uh, age range, a screening colonoscopy she, should be done. And then based on the findings, there's a periodic colonoscopy recommendation as well. And I'd encourage you to work with your primary care and your gastroenterologists. Uh, they're the ones who, who uh, are functioning in that manner, and that's who I would get their recommendations on how often you need it. If you're in a family with high risk, like someone who's had that already, then the recommendation uh, might be earlier than age 40 or 50. You might be recommended to have one in your 30s. So again, it's tailor-made in terms of the recommendation. Work with your gastroenterologist for that. I agree with you. And I remember years ago, in somewhere in the 90s, my father called and he said, hey, look, we're predisposed. Get a colonoscopy. So I think my first one was 1992 or so. So I got one. Long story short, that's kind of sort of how I met you along the way. But yes, so when you're about, unless you have family considerations, hopefully this if people take away from the show here, if you're predisposed or you're starting to get to be 38, 39, talk to your family physician and maybe get your first colonoscopy. And does this same thing apply male and female? Does it yes. matter? No, it applies but, to both sexes. So get the colonoscopy. That's gigantic. And believe it or not, since I had mine not that long ago, I've talked to some people that are into their 60s that have never had one. I believe it. So what did, let's hit the colonoscopy for a second, just a, a quick word. What did people do years ago before this technology? I mean, the colonoscopy in itself is mind-blowing as well, that that can even be done. But what did people do in the 1800s, the 1500s? <laughs> well, unfortunately, I mean, there were uh, 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 early devices that allowed you to look a short distance, but nowhere near the entirety of the colon the way we can today with such ease. Uh, so unfortunately what happened is these disease processes would show up much more advanced because it wasn't until they surfaced in some way, shape or form with significant bleeding from the rectum or things like that, that those things would be found. And then I guess at some point you just die with blockage and or uh, massive bleeding or whatever else. That's correct. So I mentioned your health regime, you work out, I am a, a, a daily worker on my property, and that that's, can be pretty physical. Well, if people go to your website, by the way, somewhere I saw a picture where you're on your tractor. I have a tractor, a bulldozer. I have all sorts of uh, fun stuff. Well, you like devices. You like technology. In I fact, I, I think <laughs> when I first met you, that's one of the things you pointed out. And then here you are working on the Da Vinci machine, but yet there are, oh, what do you do outside? We're going to go back to the Da Vinci machine in a little bit, but let's tell people outside to keep your mind right, to help people in such precise and important things where there's no room for error. What do you do outside of medicine? Yeah, I'm, I, I'm a gardener and uh, I love gardening and uh, I love building things and uh, structures. We, we live on a little over 100 acres and so I've got plenty of room to play and uh, we're always building something on the property and I've got all the family out there. So we've got, we got a, lot of, uh, a lot of family time that we put together and that's, that's what I enjoy doing. The satisfaction of something's not there you build it, it's there. You could sit back with the iced tea or a glass of wine and say, hey, wow, that's kind of fun. Just built a chicken coop uh, in the last week, and I had a, a, we built a zip line for the grandkids to play on and a couple of arbor structures. And so, it's, so you have your own zip line on the property? We do. That's we do. too much fun. <laughs> yes, it is. It's about, uh, about 300 feet long, and uh, we have a 20-foot, 20 20 foot, uh, the elevation, you'd climb up 20 feet to go off the platform and then land on a platform that's about six feet at the other end. So what did the grandkids say? What do they call you? Grand, granddad? Granddad. Grand, so they said, Granddad, what's this thing? <laughs> well, <laughs> they know what it is. Uh, it's, uh, we, we, we have to have a thrower and a catcher on those. So uh, they, they can't just go do it on their own because it's, it's pretty far up there. But, uh, yeah, we, we play with it periodically at party times. That sounds like fun. I may have to I may be knocking at your door for a visit. <laughs> say, I'm just okay. here for the zip line. <laughs> there you go. So, okay. So let's hit the Da Vinci machine again. This is fascinating. I did research since I first heard about it. In fact, I had talked to a friend of mine that he actually had a procedure done 20 years ago, unknown to me, and I've known him 35 years or so. But he said, oh, yeah, back then, 20 years ago, it was around, and it, was, it worked on him. I think he had a, uh, I don't know what kind of issue. But anyway, mm -hmm. so here it is. The Da Vinci machine is made by a company called Intuitive. Is that right? That is correct. Sunnyvale, California. I'd encourage you. You want to find out more about this and be fascinated, go to the YouTube and just type in Da Vinci Machine Intuitive. You can see the factory tour. I found that interesting. The guy that did that was fun. <laughs> he yep. went around. But here it is, a device 
that is able to do surgeries where it's helping people recover. The recovery time's easier. It seems like it's super precise. Tell us a little bit more about it. We're right here. On my side is the surgeon's console. What do you call the, the, the actual arms? The arms is the patient cart. The patient and then this cart. middle piece, kind of the brains, is the vision cart. This is That's like 2001, it. open the pod bay doors, Hal. Uh, <laughs> it, it always does it, what it, it's it, supposed to, though. Sure, it talks to, you. it talks to you a little bit, but no, it's under full control okay. with a lot of safety features built in. So it started actually around 2000, would have been, so that would have been the beginning. And then the very beginning, almost all of the Da Vinci procedures were prostates. That's predominantly what was being used at the time. Um, eventually, around 2009, they came out with additional generations of the uh, system. And in 2009, uh, uh, GYN kind of took over, if you will. They became the most proliferative specialty on the platform around that time. And it wasn't until 2014 that this current system that we're sitting in front of, the XI, uh, was uh, 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 introduced. And it was the one that was supposedly, if you will, they called it being built for general surgery because it had multi-quadrant access where the others were a little more limited and they were a lot more complex to hook up. So this one has streamlined the process and made it uh, simpler for reaching anywhere in the abdominal cavity, not just in one quadrant. And that system has been very popular. And there's additional ones that are more specialized that are uh, actually coming out all the time. And not only that, every other company out there that has an eye, there's a many companies that are looking to get into the robotic space. And so we're going to see more and more robotics and less and less laparoscopy over time because robotics adds so much more in terms of the technology. Uh, it's it's, it, it's uh, the you know, advancement of technology. Just imagine your, your iPhone compared to those original brick phones. And there's just been a huge advancement to where these things now function a lot better. And everyone uh, that's uh, in that industry is trying to copy or get around uh, the Da Vinci system because it, it, it's the one that's the most common across the country right now. Well, popular YouTube videos of robotic surgery, you, I'm sure you know, the one, the one where the grape, the skin of the grape is, is peeled reattached, off. is peeled off. And, and sewn back and on. So, that's real thin. The that's grape. pretty thin. I don't right. eat grapes that often, but I know I'm familiar with them. So, and then another video I saw where a man was talking about the capabilities. I don't know that they're doing this yet, but the capabilities of, we talked your service in the military, the capabilities of helping in a remote way doing surgeries from another country with the surgeon's console, I imagine, and the patient cart is right there somewhere else in the battlefield, perhaps, who knows what? Yeah, that's actually a full circle because in the very beginning, the whole concept of robotic surgery uh, was in part driven by this idea of being able to re operate remotely in a battlefield location. Now, it didn't take off back then for the battlefield applications, and it, and it, it became uh, uh, consumerized uh, like it is today, but um, it is something that is a possibility. The vast majority of the videos that you watch that uh, show you all these cool things that it can do, they're obviously uh, designed to show the capabilities. And again, one of the biggest capabilities is this wristed instrumentation that allows you to have the facile to be able to sew a grape uh, skin back together. And the other piece is, is when you're watching it, there's one I like that's a, it's a video of a, a, of a gentleman painting on a, on a, on a little uh, uh, postage stamp looking. It, it, you don't know that at first. You see this painting and you see the paintbrush and he's doing all this painting and then he backs up. And you realize that it's a size of a postage stamp and you were watching him paint <laughs> small little things. So it's that high def magnified view that is actually in 3D. In laparoscopy, you see a 2D image and you have to extrapolate what the 3D is actually looks like in your mind. Where in robotics, you have a camera for each eye. It's only one shaft that goes down in there, but there are actually two cameras in it. So you have a left eye camera and a right eye camera, which is, allows you to see in three-dimensional. So when I put my head in the viewfinder over there, I see a 3D view compared to what people look at laparoscopically, which is only 2D. That advancement alone has been significant. Surgically, as far as surgical procedures go, what limitations do you, what the, the, can't the machine do? Does it do brain surgery? There's a different one. This is not one for brain surgery. The Da Vinci Intuitive is not. There are brain surgery robots. There are spine robots. There are joint knee joints and, and sh shoulder joints. We have those here. Uh, we have two of those here, at least, the, um, of that I just mentioned, uh, here at HCA Houston Healthcare Tomball. But they, the key is that uh, there's a robotic platform that's designed for each space. Now, they're not uh, all-encompassing. For instance, 
there's no sense uh, at this point if I was doing, let's say, a hemorrhoid surgery, there's no robot for that. If I was doing a lump or a bump on the skin, there's no robot for that. That's still an open procedure, but it's a minimal surgical uh, endeavor to begin with. So there are a few things that, you, uh, that are not robotically uh, uh, adapted at this point, but I think as time goes on, there will be technology adaptions, whether it's robotics or not, uh, that for virtually every surgery we do. So when someone reaches out to you, you're, you're not limited by just doing robotic surgery. You do all kinds of things as well. Let's, let's highlight again. We're talking with Dr. Brian Harkins right here in the operating room in Tomball, Texas at the hospital. Let's tell people they're listening. They say, man, if I ever have a problem, this is the guy I'm going to call. <laughs> I'd highly recommend it, by the way. But what is the menu? And they can go to your website, which is? At drbrianharkins.com. drbrianharkins.com. But give us an idea of the menu where someone would say, I need Dr. Harkins services. What are the things you're doing again? Well, I'm a general surgeon by training. Uh, so I do pretty much all the uh, structures in the abdominal cavity traditional to general surgery. I don't do lung disease, heart disease. I don't do those operations uh, anymore. I had some training with that, but don't do those. I don't do the GYN component, and I don't do anything on the kidney. Most of the other intra-abdominal comp uh, compartments I, I have uh, capability to operate on using predominantly robotics. That's been my focus at this point, and I'm, I'm a total practice robotic surgeon, meaning I do everything that way. I still can do laparoscopy, but I don't really see a need for it at this point. Everything that I could potentially do laparoscopically, I can do robotically, so I'm not going to use that advanced platform. There are things that do require open technique, and I am certainly trained in the military, had plenty of open experience in those early days, and so if I have to, that's the procedure I would use would be an open technique, but most of those things are going away as well because I can now do them through minimally invasive approach of the robot. So you have, as far as, go back to the, now, now did, were you a surgeon in the military yes. where there's actual battlefield situations? Yes, so I was, at oh those, after those eight years of Air Force uh, uh, on the nuclear missile system, I was doing night school, got a college out of the way, got accepted into medical school, and I took a scholarship with the Army. I had Army and Air Force uh, scholarships offered to me. The Army had more places to train, so I switched over to that branch. Um, I did my uh, training at Eisenhower Army Medical Center in Augusta, Georgia. That was where I did my residency training. And then after I finished there, I, w I practiced for uh, three years at Fort McClellan in Alabama uh, at that uh, post before it closed down. And I was uh, a military surgeon and that got that uh, early exposure and, uh, and, and got to do a ton of stuff because as a military surgeon, you're broadly trained and you get to apply that, that training when you first get out, uh, probably more so than in many other places. It's almost like being that country surgeon, which is kind of what drew me here to, to Tomball. At the time when I came in 97, it was pretty disconnected, if you will, from Houston. There wasn't as clean of a connection as there is today. Uh, it's, it's kind of like one of the suburbs now, but back then it was a little more separated, and I like that environment, uh, and that's why I chose to come here. But yes, I was a military surgeon for a total of eight years counting residency. So you were seeing, I would think in the military, there were regular procedures needed to be done, but were you seeing like emergency situations? Oh, sure. and, and what were the things that, that would happen in an emergency? Gunshot wounds or what? Well, no, so I, that's an, that happens in the civilian sector as well, of course. And, more uh, and more, yeah, unfortunately, more, yeah. every the, day. The knife yes. and gun club exists in the civilian sector as well. Right. So I was a surgeon in the military taking care of active duty and dependents. So I had the full range of everything you would normally see as a surgeon. My, my, I was in during Desert Storm. I was a second year resident. Uh, the first years went over and acted as general medical officers, and some of the fourth and fifth years uh, went over in Desert Storm and acted as surgeons under guidance. Uh, the second and third years, we stayed home and took care of patients being sent back. So I never actually went to Desert Storm, even though I was active during that time, uh, which um, I, I, I'd never had any true combat experience in that setting. The other thing that you're doing is and we said this at the beginning of the show, in addition to doing the procedures, helping your patients, you're also a professor in a way. You're out there teaching people about the procedures, what you've learned with the robotic surgery. You're all over the country. I, I, I got a text. You're saying, hey, I'm just landing from coming back from California. So you're out there helping and telling people. When you go and, and tell others, what are you talking about? You're telling them about the machine, advanced tech techniques, basic techniques. Tell us about a, a day in the travel or the month in the, in the life of Dr. Brian Harkins. 
Well, actually, when I got here to Tomball in 97, laparoscopy was fairly new, and I did the same thing back then. Uh, I was doing a lot of, of uh, teaching and training on laparoscopic techniques, and it was kind of fun, so I enjoyed that. But then eventually, everybody started doing laparoscopy, and they didn't need discussion anymore. And I'm, I say they being the surgeons and the, the hospitals and all. So it kind of went away, and I just became a country surgeon for a while. Robotics came along. It was fairly new in the general surgery space, and, uh, and I really took to it. I really just uh, d uh, dove into it completely once I bought in that this was where things were going to go and got fairly uh, busy and fairly uh, experienced early on had a message that I shared a couple of places locally here and my intuitive representatives that uh, saw that message and they liked the way it was delivered and they invited me to start talking for them. And so I did and uh, it has blossomed from there and I, uh, I, I must be halfway decent at it because they keep calling me back for more so I must not be doing too bad of a job. And I've started doing that also now for another company uh, called ConMed and they're the ones who sell the advanced insufflation system that we use, the one that blows gas into the abdomen that allows it to be maintained better and keeps the pressure low. So I, I, I enjoy it. It's, uh, I'm talking to surgeons mostly and I do a lot of those. Um, I think I'm approaching a thousand events at this point over the last seven years. Uh, so I've been doing it quite, quite a few times. And many of those events are also things like training classes where we will meet up with, uh, I have, in fact, I, I have one tomorrow where I have surgeons coming to a lab nearby and I'm going to go down and teach them uh, hernia uh, technique on the robot. They're brand new to the robot and I'm going to show, show them the technique and tips and tricks on how to do it. We do that for hernia, we do that for colon and a few other procedures as well. As someone begins their practices as a surgeon, how do they learn about this machine? I guess there's some kind of training. Is that part of what you're doing, or, or what happens? Yes. I mean, it's a, again, encourage you go to the radiobill.net, the YouTube channel, or just my name, Bill Napick, on the YouTube channel. But look at this machine. It's complicated, and you better know what you're doing. So how, how do we learn? I mean, there's enough to learn, I guess. I've never been to medical school, but there's a lot to learn, and now you're going to be using these various instruments here. Well, traditionally, we've always learned through medical school, through training. And in those early days when we were all open surgeons, laparoscopy was brand new, and it took a while before that became taught in the medical schools. And so anybody that wanted to learn it who was already out in practice actually had to go somewhere to like one of the courses I'm talking about where they would watch somebody do it, get some instruction, and then go home and try and do it. That's now in the phase we're in with robotics as well. But I will tell you that the medical schools are figuring this out and they're starting to offer more and more robotic training to their residents so that when they come out, they will be just as, as skilled on the robot as they are laparoscopically, as they are open technique. And that's where, the, give it five years, 10 years, the, this won't be a thing for me anymore. I'll just be a country surgeon in Tomball again because everyone will be doing the robot, just like in those early days of laparoscopy, it became the norm. This will be the norm in, in short order. Well, you do many things. You're an incredible individual. I th think you're also a big thinker. There are times when you're on your tractor. I'm guessing. I've never been there. You're, maybe you're on, the, on the, the zip line thinking. But wherever you are, when you're thinking about the future of what you're doing, you're on the tractor and you're saying, man, look how far this has come since I started, since I had the idea to even be a doctor. What are you thinking about 20 years, 10, 20 years from now? as far as advancements in medicine in, in terms of even surgery. I know you have an idea. <laughs> What's well, it going to be like? I, I have an idea where I think things are moving towards, but I, but I always tease when I'm out there that uh, to the younger surgeons that, you know, I did laparoscopy when it was new. I've done robotics when it's new. This is it for me. My, this is, this, I'm going to die a laparoscopic a robotic surgeon, that is, that whatever new comes out, whether you're – working in holograms the guy, yeah. that's the next guys they can pick it up and learn the new technique i'm going to i'm going to go out with robotics in the over the next 10 years or so but it's going to go somewhere right i mean Absolutely. It, i mean just the advancements in everything it's just fascinating yeah it's going to go into in, uh, decreasing size uh continued minimal access uh getting smaller and smaller entry points uh, potentially, I mean, there's there's all sorts of, of uh, things being looked at with magnets where you control the, you put something in and control it on the inside from the outside using a magnet. Many things are, are starting to come about with that. But I think the robotic platforms are going to continue to evolve where they have a smaller footprint in the OR, 
they're cheaper. That's the other thing that needs to happen. What this does is, this machine cost, by the way? Uh, this is circa $2 million for a, a, a DaVinci XI system. Uh, and they have other platforms that are in that same vicinity uh, from 1.2 in the, up to 2 million. And that's just the, my knowledge of it. I'm not in that uh, world, part of the world, but I, I know enough about it to be able to say that. Uh, I think there, the price is going to continue to come down. More and more systems are going to find ways to bring that uh, price point down while not suffering any of the uh, uh, advantages of the advanced technologies that we get from the XI system. I wonder who thought of this idea, this Da Vinci machine. Uh, the, the, Cal the company's in Sunnyvale, California. Right. How long have they been around? Uh, it was around 99, I want to say, and again, this is just uh, my general knowledge on this, that there was a different company that they were, uh, I believe it was the Zeus is, was, was what it was called, and they were battling over who was going to control this technology and one bought the other or something like that. And so around 2000, the DaVinci system actually uh, came into existence, and it was uh, as, as early as 2007, 8, the prostates were just completely transitioned over to where uh, it was open technique in 2000. By 2008, it was 90% uh, uh, done on the robot. Here we are, Tom Ball, Texas, in the operating room with Dr. Brian Harkins. We have a few minutes left, Doctor. What else you want to tell people about anything, whether it's uh, what you do in relaxing, medicine? I mean, you're doing great work, Tom Ball, Texas. Yeah, you, you mentioned the country doctor. Well, it's not really the country anymore. Everything's working its way in every direction in Houston from a real estate standpoint. But it does. When I came here for my procedure uh, a few weeks ago, maybe a month or so ago, I like the idea. One, you made me feel so at ease when I first met you, meeting you that morning before the procedure. But also, I just like the idea of coming out here. And I also talked to some people that uh, about it, and, and they're like, oh, yeah, we're very familiar with it. So what else do you want people to know? And about your practice, let's tell people how they can reach you. The website is? It's uh, drbrianharkins.com, or you could go through tomballsurgery.com. Either of those will get to me. Uh, I do have some stuff on the, on the website that gives a little bit more personal look and uh, more about the practice and more about robotics. Um, one of the things that here at HCA Houston Healthcare, Tom Ball, I, I've been lucky enough to be involved in this process, as I mentioned, thanks to a, a visionary CEO. I got, uh, when HCA bought this facility around 2017, they came in and they're very forward thinking with robotics and liked uh, the, what we had done here and offered me a position as a medical director of robotics for the Gulf Coast Division. So I have a, a 16 or so hospitals and I'm involved in helping drive their robotic programs and, and improve their robotic quality across the board. So that's been a fun part of a transition for my practice. I mean, I was uh, just on the boot, on the ground, you know, doing surgeries all the time, person for a long time. The educational piece, the programmatic piece, has been a, a, a growth piece for me in terms of uh, keeping me interested with this whole thing. So I'm really excited about that aspect of it uh, moving forward. I still love taking care of patients, and I, I won't let that go until I decide to completely hang it up. Uh, and I think that is one of the things I would point out. No matter who you see uh, as a as a patient going to see a physician, make sure you feel comfortable. That's the, that's the biggest piece. Um, if, if your comfort level is there, that's a major component of how well the procedure is gonna go and how well your outcomes will be. You can't go into something reluctantly and expect it to turn out great. It may turn out okay, but there's better than okay. And I, I think that's the, what I hope I've been able to completely uh, recognize in, in my uh, 30 years of practice here is that it's always about the, uh, the patient that's what matters most, and it's always about uh, staying abreast of the technology advancements that might improve your patient's care. Whether it's a robotic platform over laparoscopy, which was better than open, whether it's working at lower pressures inside the abdomen with the insufflator, which is a new wave that's just now uh, spreading, and I believe strongly that that's helping as well. Uh, all of those kinds of things are out there. In medicine, we sometimes get hung up into um, a dogmatic approach of we've always done it this way and my patients do okay or my patients do well but better is possible in many of those situations and you won't ever get there unless you're constantly looking at what's possible thank you so much dr brian harkins right here he's a general surgeon in tomball texas he is out there spreading the word helping people use the technology the da vinci machine and so many other things here in the medical field thank you so much for being on the show my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for your military service. Thank you. And thanks for helping me a couple weeks ago. Absolutely. My pleasure.